present. So we know how many moles of it, because that's basically saying how many molecules we have. We're going to use that mole of mass. So in this case, we have for every three moles of carbon come from one mole of the C3H6, because there's three carbon atoms in every molecule. So if I have a mole of C3H6, I'm going to have three moles of carbon. So then to get the moles of carbon, I just take the 0.594 moles of C3 times three moles of carbon over one mole of C3H6, and that gives me the moles of carbon. Okay, And I do the same thing with the hydrogen. Okay, take the moles of the compound I have, multiply it by the molar ratio for hydrogen. In this case, it's six moles of hydrogen for every one mole of C3H6, and that gives me the point, I'm sorry, 3.56 moles of hydrogen. Okay, so to sum up, in this case, we're taking the mass of the propylene, converting that into moles using its molar mass. Because remember, moles is a way of telling how many molecules of that substance I have. Now, once you know how many molecules, you're just using the, rate, the scripts to create the ratio of atoms to molecules. And that, and that way allows us to convert moles of the, subs, of the substance to moles of individual atoms. Okay. So, okay, Caitlin, you have your hand up. Um, did you have a question? Yes, I'll post the uh, answers, Gabriel. Yep. Yeah, I'm gonna. They should. They'll. They. They'll be online tonight. Okay, so 18. So 18 is very similar to the one I just showed you. Okay. Again, I have 2.2 grams of potassium bromide. Okay, again, I'm figuring out the molar mass of the potassium bromide. Okay, so in this case, it's 119 grams per And then I'm just converting that into moles. So I have 0 0.0178 moles of potassium bromide. And then same thing I did before. I take the 0 0.178 moles of potassium bromide, and it's a one-to-one -one ratio now. So it's just one mole of potassium bromide for every one mole of potassium. So in this case, the moles of potassium is the same as the moles of potassium bromide because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Okay. Um, and I think I, someone commented it was a di they also wanted to look at a different question, right? 38. Okay. So let me go down to 38. Okay. We, we talked about this problem probably right at the end of the last lecture. This is where we're trying to figure out an empirical formula. So an empirical formula, if you remember, is the simplest ratio of elements that are present in the compound. So in this case, we have a compound that's 43.6% of the mass is phosphorus, and then 56.4% of the mass is oxygen. So right away you think, okay, these are percents. How do we get masses out of them? Well, it's pretty simple. We just we just imagine we had 100 grams of the substance. So if we had 100 grams of the substance, I would have 43.6 grams of phosphorus and 56.4 grams of oxygen. So like the other problem, our first step is to figure out how many atoms we have. And to figure out how many atoms we have, we just convert that into moles. So in this case, I have 3.6 grams of phosphorus. So I just use the molar mass of phosphorus here. And that ends up turning out to be 1.41 moles of phosphorus. I probably should have put a P here just to be a little more specific. But this is the phosphorus. 
for the second one, okay, I have 56 point grams of oxygen, and I'm going to use a molar mass of one oxygen atom. Okay, 16 grams of O for one mole of oxygen. Okay, we're not using 32 because 32 is the molar mass of an oxygen molecule. That's O2. We're just looking at the molar mass of a single oxygen atom. So that's where the 16 comes from. Okay, so I just I do that calculation, 56.4 times 1 over 16, and I get 3.525 moles. All right, so then I have the ratio of each element. It's, now, the ratio is 1.41 moles of phosphorus to 3.525 moles of oxygen. Okay, so I do have a ratio of elements, but to, for it to be a formula, we want a, whole, a simple whole number ratio. So I'm going to take this ratio of 1.41 to 3.525 and simplify it. So the first step and is I'm just going to take both numbers and divide them by the smaller of the two number of moles. So in the first one, I take 1.41 divided by 1.41, and that guarantees I'm going to have a 1. And the second one, I do the calculation. Now it gets to be 2.5. So this one's pretty straightforward to solve. You can see now I have a 1 to 2.5 ratio. What I want to do is to make it a whole number ratio. So in this case, since I, it's, it's half, and even if it's close to half, if it was like 2.49 or 2.451, you could assume, okay, it's still within your significant figure range of being a half. So I'm just multiplying both sides by 2, get rid of this point five. five oxygen atoms. And that becomes my empirical formula. Okay. All right, so any other questions? Caitlin, you, you had your hand raised. Did you have a question? Let me see. Okay, Alina, you have a question. That's okay. Uh, hang on, Alina. Let me. I'll make you live so you can. Yes. Okay. If you did, chose to do this as your homework instead of the homework I posted in the Chem 101, you can just scan it and email it. Otherwise, if you want to just do the Chem 101 problems, they're basically the same type of problems here. Um, you can complete that and send it in, okay? E either one is fine. Okay. Um, Caitlin, you, can you hear me now? Okay. I don't know why you're just hearing music. I'll um it could just be an issue with your headset or your audio connection. Um if you're not able to I, I'm not going to be able to debug that tonight, but I'll I'm, I am writing this so you'll be able to get it if you're not able to hear it right now. Um okay, any other questions uh, relative to the homework. I will, again, I will be posting the solutions so you will be able to take a look at them. Um, if you're still having trouble with them, I would say, if you haven't done it, I would suggest trying the Chem 101 problems. They are optional, but it's a good resource to work through them. And I'll even post a few more based upon where some of the people had questions on it tonight, just, so, just as extra practice, okay? Um, so, that being said, any more issues, uh, any more issues with the homework?
Okay. All right. Let me then in that case, I'm going to start on the new material. Now, it looks like our connection is pretty poor tonight. It's probably because a lot of uh, classes are teaching online and it's probably overloading it. But I'm going to, if I'm not able to share my screen, I'll just kind of guide you where I am in the lecture and you can follow along with the uh, with the stuff I, with the slides I posted. Okay, so we are starting with so tonight. I want to start on just identifying different types of reactions and a little bit of balancing equations. I did notice some people actually already started the the homework problems I posted for this section. So um, yeah, actually, some people you even completed them. So that's actually uh, pretty impressive. So tonight, I want to get into just how to recognize different types of chemical equations, some exercising on how to balance those equations, and how to just identify such as reduction reactions and and um, decomposition reactions, double replacement reactions, and give you some tools that will allow you to predict products for specific reactions. Um, yeah, I I haven't. Yeah, I, my screen got shut down, so I'm not I'm not sh sharing any slides right now. But I'm gonna tr try this again, and hopefully it will work. It's uh. Let's see if I want to go to the slideshow. And I'm going to share And just give me a signal if you are able to see the screen. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, good. All right, so I'm going to try sharing this again and good. Okay. So to start out, let's see if I can just share one, make sure I'm only sharing one window. Okay, that's better. Okay, so we started out earlier in the past chapters. We just looked at
Okay. So let me start where I left off. So the chapters um, we looked at introducing element symbols to represent individual atoms, molecules, and compounds. And a balance equation is going to use the symbols to represent the relative masses on each side of the equation equally. So if we remember going back to our law of conservation of matter, the n amount of products and reactants are going to equal the same amount in an equation. Okay, so let me go. So here's an example. Okay, we have CH4 methane combined with oxygen, and we're getting two products, carbon dioxide and water. Now, what I've added here is this coefficient 2. So that's going to represent two oxygen molecules. And on the product side, I have also have two. So in this case now, look at the number of atoms on each side of the equation. Okay, two, four oxygen atoms on this side, this side, and I also have four hydrogen atoms on this side and four hydrogen atoms on the other side. So that means, okay, I'm following the law of conservation of matter because the number of atoms on the left side of the equation is equal to the number of atoms on the right of the equation. Now, the original equation, just when it was unbalanced, just showed the CH4, the O2, the CO2, and the H2O. It's these coefficients that were added in that actually make the equation balanced. The two end up showing up as these two separate oxygen molecules, so two sets of O2, and then the H2O represents two individual water molecules. So that's what makes the equation balanced. Okay. Can you, can everyone still hear me? Okay. Looks like, okay, it looks like there are some issues with me sharing the screen. Um, so hang on one second. I'm going to try one more trick and see if this works. And instead of sharing the screen, I'm going to share the file. And then I'm just going to tell you what page I'm on because it seems to be that the is really awful tonight, and sharing is just not working very well. All right, so let me give me a few minutes. All right, I'm going to share the file and we'll see if this works better. I'm um, uploading lecture seven notes. So hopefully you can see it. And I'll try to tell you what slide I'm on. And I'm hoping this will work. It's obviously not ideal, but it's um, better than how it's working. So right now, 
see if you can take it just, I'll wait a few minutes see if you can able to open that file and let me know if you're not able to get to it. Yeah, so just click on that and open up the notes and see if that will open up. And currently, I am on, I'll start where we left off. I'm on page four of the slide. So this is where it says figure four, two at the top, and it's showing the molecules. So I'm, I'll, just, I'll wait a minute, see if this works and give you a chance to... So if you're not able to get to it, if you look on the right side of your panel, it's going to be under share content. You're not saying it. OK. Let me try one more time. Okay, good. Okay, so let's see if this works a little better. A little more lively. Now, I'm not going to be able to do the animation with my cursor, but I'll try to describe what I'm pointing at. Okay, so now I'm on figure four, two. So this is pretty much a balanced equation. Okay, again, we have methane, two oxygen molecules, and as a product, we have a single CO2 molecule and two water molecules. Okay, so this is just how we're representing the equation, and that the coefficient two in front of the water and the O2 just indicates I have two molecules of O2 and two molecules of water. Okay, so let me move ahead to the next slide and hopefully, okay, this is much better. Okay, so that example just showed some of the main aspects of a reaction, okay. The substances on the left are gonna be the reactants and in
I'm back. So, so in this example, okay, we have the different aspects of the chemical reaction. So the plus sign is separating the individual reactants and products, and then the arrow is going to separate the reactant and product from the left and right size, and then the relative numbers of each reactant and product are represented by the coefficients. And just like with um, subscripts, if the value is one, we don't show the, the that that number. We just show it any, for a coefficient. We'll just show it if it's above one. Okay. So similar to um, ratios in a molecular formula. Okay, it's or an ionic formula, it's going to be common practice to use the smallest whole number ratios in a chemical equation. So, and these coefficients are going to represent the relative amounts of reactants and products reactions. So you can actually interpret this as a ratio. And it may not be a specific the amount in a reaction you're observing in a lab, but we can still interpret it as a ratio. So in the previous example, methane and oxygen react to yield carbon dioxide and water in one to two to one to two ratio, where each number represents the, the relative ratios of each reactant and product pair. Okay. So, Irregardless of the absolute number of reactants and products I have, the ratio is always going to be the same given that chemical equation because it's the simplest ratio of elements for that particular reaction. Okay. So, as I said before, this equation that I showed you is balanced. So that means that there are equal numbers of atoms for each element on the reactant and product side. And that's following our law of conservation of matter that states that matter cannot be created nor destroyed. So the number of atoms we start with is going to equal the number of atoms we end up with. Okay, so let's... Now... In the case of an equation, if an element is going to appear in more than one formula on a given side of the equation, okay, we have to, when we balance it, we want to make sure we're taking the total number of each atom in the cases. So, example, if I go back to that earlier reaction, um, let me just move back a few slides. So here, if I look on the reactant side, I have two molecules of O2. So that means I have four atoms in all on the reactant side. On the product side, the oxygen is in two different locations. Okay, I have two atoms of oxygen in the carbon dioxide. And then I, in the two sets of water molecules, I have a total of two oxygen atoms there. So combined, okay, I have four oxygen atoms in on the product side and four oxygen atoms on the reactant side. Okay, the only difference is on the product side, the oxygen atoms are part of two separate compounds. Some of them are in the carbon dioxide, some of them are in the water. So that's what I was indicating when something appears in more than one location and when we're balancing it, we want to make sure we add up the total number of each element in both compounds together. Okay. So, again, if I'm confirming that this is balanced, I'm going to look at the atoms of each on each side of the equation and just make sure that I have the same number on the reactant product side. So in this case, when I look at the number of carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, and oxygen atoms on each side, I notice that the totals are equal. So the 
total carbons on the reactant side is one, the total atoms on the product side is one, so it's balanced. For hydrogen, I have four hydrogen atoms on the reactant side, I have four hydrogen atoms on the product side. Two water molecules times two hydrogen atoms per water molecule. So two times two is four. And so on both sides, again, I have four of each. It's balanced. And then for oxygen, two sets of oxygen molecules on the left. And each oxygen molecule has two oxygen atoms. So that's four. And the same on the product side. But in this case, the oxygen, I have two oxygen atoms in the CO2 and then two oxygen atoms in the two sets of water molecules. So in both, if I add them up, I have four there, so my equation is balanced. Okay. So here's an unbalanced equation. So one simple approach is we can just balance it by inspection. Okay. So in a case like this, I would ju you just start with one element at a time, and I add coefficients to the elements to make the equation balanced. So in this particular problem, are there any elements that you see that are not balanced? And just, okay, and what element is that? Oxygen, correct. So if you see on the left, I have one oxygen atom in water, and on the right, I have two oxygen atoms present in that O2. So if I'm going to balance it, I want to put two in front of the H2O. So when I do that, let me just click on to the next slide. Now, you see here, I have two water molecules. So I have two oxygen atoms on the left and two oxygen atoms on the right. So my oxygens are balanced. Now, is my equation balanced now completely? No, correct. So when I, what happened is when I put a two in front of that water, correct, good job, Tony, I have four hydrogen atoms on the left, but only two on the right. So what I need to do now is I, I need to add another, sub, another coefficient in front of the H2. So that's going to balance the hydrogens. So then, my equation is balanced. Okay, so you notice with this with the steps I did, I started with one element, I balanced it, I looked at the next element, and I balanced that. Okay. So now in this case, with this balanced equation, I have two sets of oxygen atoms on each side of the equation and two sets of hydrogen atoms on each side of the equation. Now let me ask you a question and then raise just raise your hand to see if you know the answer to this. Why can't I change the subscript, which are the little numbers, to balance the equation? Okay, Tony, you have a reply. Let me see if make you live okay what what do you, why do you think that's not the case you said what 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 can you do to change it or can we change it to balance it yeah right my question was are you allowed why are you not allowed to change the subscripts to balance an equation because it defined the molecule itself right Correct. So that defines a molecule. So if I change the subscripts, what am I changing? And you just said it. The molecule. 
You're changing the model. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Megan, do you have something to add? You can talk now. If not, or hang on one second. Richard, did you have something to add? Hello. Yes. Hello? I can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Um, because it's a molecule, so you can't change the subscript. Right. By changing the subscript, you're changing the molecule. So if I yeah. have, let's say, if I made, I put a two in front of that oxygen, mm -hmm. and made it H2O2, yields H2 plus O2. So let me go yeah, back yeah. two slides, and I'll show you no, what no, I mean. No, if I put a two, no, if I put a two in front of that oxygen, okay, that would equation, but it's not the same equation anymore. Okay, because I changed water into hydrogen peroxide. So now I'm describing a completely different reaction. So when you change the those little numbers, you're changing the equation you're describing. So you're describing a completely different equation now. You're not you change you can't change your substances by to balancing an equation. So when we balance an equation, we want to make sure we're only changing the coefficients. Yes, you're correct, Megan. So you're basically you're changing what chemicals are reacting, so you're describing a different equation. So when you're balancing, you're not allowed to change coefficients. Oh, I'm sorry. You're not. You are allowed to change the coefficients, which are the big numbers. You cannot change the little numbers, the subscripts. Okay. Now, I realize. Now, in earlier lessons, we may have adjusted subscripts when we were trying to figure out what a formula was, and that's the case. Like if we're looking at ions, and we had to determine the ionic formula for a compound, and we're balancing charges. That's okay. But once the formulas have been established, and which is what we have in this case. We already know what our formulas are. When we just go ahead and balancing, we're, we cannot change the, the little numbers, the subscripts. We can only change the large numbers, which is the amount or the ratio of each individual substance in the formula. So that's a common mistake people make when they're balancing equations. I did put on the Chem 101 porthole for this week's assignment, I put some examples. So it's going to, I would, when you try them out, you'll be able to see different examples of balancing equations and it'll give you some feedback on that. So try those exercises. And I'll even post a few more examples of um, balancing up there this week. Okay. Now, this is an interesting example. Now, if you take this equation, I have C2H6. Okay, who had a question? I see a hand raised. Um, Okay, someone said someone has a question. Who who has a question? Okay. If Okay, just so um if you have anyone else has a question, just uh, raise your hand and I'll see if I can get to you. Rich, did you have a question? Okay. 
Um, okay, so look at this example. It says C2H6 plus O2 yields 3, H, I'm sorry, H2O plus CO2. Now, in this particular case, we started, we started to balance it. So someone added the 3H2 to balance the hydrogens, and they put a 2 in front of the carbon dioxide to balance the carbons. So right now, the, the, the hydrogens are balanced and the carbons are balanced. Now the tricky thing is, is we, now we have to try to balance the oxygens. And before we add that fraction in here, this person has a problem, okay? We have an odd number of oxygens on one side and an even number of oxygens on the other side, okay? So if you notice, on the right for the product, we have three oxygen atoms in the water and four oxygen atoms in the carbon dioxide. So we have seven on the product side. But with the oxygen, we have an O2. So we have an even on the right side. So what this person did is they took seven halves and put it for the oxygen. Now, what's seven halves times two? And you can just type in the answer. If I take seven halves, which is the same as three and a half times two, what is it? Seven, correct. So technically, this equation is balanced. Okay. So we have we have a ratio that is correct. However, we don't want to represent an equation with fractions because we, we want to think of this as whole number relationships because technically molecules exist as whole units. We don't have half molecules. So once we have a balanced equation, we can just multiply out the fraction. So to get rid of that two in the denominator, we just take every part of the ratio and multiply it by two. So instead of one C2H6, I have two C2H6s, and then seven halves times two is seven, three times two is six for the waters, and two times two is four for the carbon dioxide. So now, by multiplying everything by two for my coefficients, I end up with the bottom equation. And because with any ratio, as long as you multiply or divide all parts of that ratio by the same number, you preserve the ratio. My bottom equation is now still balanced. So I was able to do a shortcut. Otherwise, I'd probably have to do a lot of trial and error to try to figure out that seven is the best way to balance this. But if you're stuck with a situation like this and you can only bet by using a fraction, it's okay to start off with that fraction and then just multiply it out. So in this case, now we just we can check. If I look at my carbons, I have Okay, I'm back. So let me start out I, before I boot, booted off for the ninth time. 
Um, if you look at the bottom, I have four carbon atoms on the left, four carbon atoms on the right. For the hydrogen, I have two times six hydrogen atoms on the left, and then six times two hydrogen atoms on the right. And then for oxygen, I have 15 oxygen atoms on the left. And then on the right, I have six times one oxygen atoms in the water, and then four times two oxygen atoms in the CO2. So six, and then six plus eight is 14 again. So I end up with a balanced equation. Okay. So, any questions so far? So, if you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll. S yes. Okay, let me make you live so I can. The symbol next to the oxygen in the past uh, slide. Okay, let me go back. The symbol next to the oxygen on this, on this slide, or the one be or the one I. Yeah, there was like a slanted I in a parenthesis, but it's not on this one. Uh, let me just move up one. Yeah. Oh, okay. There. Yes. Okay, so the okay, let me. I didn't get didn't get to that, but I'll I'll mention that right now. Okay, so sometimes in equations you'll see some extra information about the state of each substance. So here in these little letters and parentheses indicate the state. So G is for gas, L is for liquid, S is for solid. And then AQ is aqueous, so that just refers to a solute, a substance that's dissolved in water. So in this case, I have sodium that's solid, and it's combining with water, and then it's producing sodium hydroxide, which is a substance that's dissolved in water, and then hydrogen gas. So this is the reaction I showed you one of the earlier lectures when we took an alkali metal and we dropped it in water and we saw the flame coming on the water. So that reaction was produced by the sodium mixing with the water and we saw hydrogen gas being bubbled out and it also produced a lot of heat. And the flame you saw was that hydrogen gas igniting and actually burning as it was being produced because hydrogen is a flammable gas. So that reaction we were seeing, was, the initial reaction you were seeing was this action of sodium with water. Okay, so let me go on. So in addition to the state, you may also see indication of energy changes in a reaction. So sometimes you might see if a reaction involves heating, you might see a delta above the arrow just to indicate that it's you, you're using heat to drive this reaction forward. Now, in some cases above that arrow, you may also see another compound. And in those cases, if you see a compound or a substance written above the arrow and where the, this uh, delta sign is now, that's an indicator, that's an indicator of a catalyst. So in a chemical reaction, a catalyst is a substance that speeds up a reaction, but doesn't necessarily get used up in the reaction. So sometimes you might add something to the reaction that cause a reaction go faster. But after the reaction is over, the catalyst is has not been used up at all. So it doesn't participates in the reaction but doesn't get used up. It's so it's a reaction product. Okay. Now 
sometimes we can break down these equations and show a little more detail about what's going on in the reaction because and a lot of reactions take place in solution. So when reactions occur in solution, we can actually write them with a little greater levels of detail. So we look at this reaction. We have calcium chloride plus silver nitrate and we're producing calcium nitrate and silver chloride as a product. So even though these are ions and ionic compounds, because the formulas resemble molecules, we refer to this as a molecular equation, even though it's kind of a misnomer because there's actually no molecules that are involved in this reaction. It's just all ionic compounds. But if we don't represent um, if we represent ionic compounds and they in the way we represent them, they, it's similar to a formula for a molecule. We still refer to it as a molecular equation. So that's one level of detail. Now, in reality, when these salts dissolve in water, they actually separate. So we have this calcium chloride ion. And it actually, the ions separate from each other when, the, when they're in water. So the calcium ions just float along on, on their own, and the two chlorine ions float down on their own. So notice how we represent them now. We show a calcium with a 2 plus ionic charge, plus two sets of chloride ions floating along by themselves. So this is a more realistic or more and more de better detailed model about what's going on when the calcium chloride dissolves in water. The ions separate and float around on them or on. Now we see the same thing with the AgNO3. Okay, the, the silver separates from the nitrate, and so we end up with the, those two silver ions and the two nitrate ions. And they're again, they're just floating around on their own. And then the same with the calcium nitrate. Okay, the calcium separates from the nitrate, so we have one calcium ion and two sets of NO3 again. Now, remember what these NO3s are, is a polyatomic ion. So it's a group of atoms that are bonded together, but they that unit has a charge, so it actually act like it's a single atom in these reactions, even though it's technically multiple atoms, but it's it's polyatomic ions. So they are single ions, but they're made of multiple atoms. So we talked about this I think, in the end of uh, chapter two when we were looking at naming ionic compounds. Now, if I go back to the previous equation on the previous slide, the silver chloride, which is at the end of this equation, is still solid. So that part did dissolve at all. So we're not going to represent that as separate ions. OK, so now if I show that level of detail in the equation, I get this much more complicated equation, but it shows all the dissolved ions that are as a result of this reaction. So instead of showing the calcium chloride as a single formula, I show it as a single calcium ion plus two chloride ions, and they're both dissolved in water. The same thing with the silver nitrate. Two sets of silver ions plus two sets of nitrate ions, both of them dissolved in water. And then I'm producing two sets of calcium ions and two sets of nitrate ions dissolved in water. And then my two units of silver chloride, which is not dissolved. It just falls out and it becomes a solid, a solid substance at the bottom of the reaction. So when I write, represent 
a reaction this way, we refer to it as a complete ionic equation. I'm showing all the ions in this reaction. Now, if you look at this, if I look at the reactant and product side, it seems like there's a lot of ions that are there that aren't really doing anything. So if I, can you see any ions that are on the left side and the right side that really haven't changed in the reaction? Can anyone just name one? Here we go. Yep. Calcium, the calcium ion, the chloride ion, and I would even say the uh, nitrate, the NO3 ion. So all three of those don't haven't really done anything. No, actually, I could, actually, I'm sorry, I would apologize. The chloride ion did change. But the calcium ion and the nitrate ion look exactly the same on either side of the equation. So when we have ions like that, that are just looking and they're watching what's going on, but they're not participating, we call them spectator ions. So, so those two spectator ions, which are needed because you have to maintain charge neutrality, you have to have a neutral solution, but in the reaction, neither of them are physically or chemically changed. So if I want to simplify the equation and just get rid of the spectator ions, I'll focus on only the ions that are changing in this reaction. And that results in the ionic equation. OK, so I simplified this reaction. I'm just focusing on the components that have changed. So let me just go back to that previous slide again. So you see the calcium is the same on either side, so I'm going to take that out. And the, and the nitrate ions, the NO3 ions, are the same are in both sides, so I'm going to remove that. And so I'm only going to show the chloride and the silver. And I'm going to result in that equation. And because I have, because in my, now in the original equation, I had two silvers and two chlorines producing two silver chlorides. Well, now in this net ionic equation, I can simplify it a little more. So I'm just reduce it to keep the coefficients as simple as possible. So now I just have silver and chlorine producing silver chloride. And that by removing the spectator ions, I result in this net ionic equation. So it's just another level of detail, but it's really just focusing on what's changing in this reaction. Okay, questions? Okay, I don't see any. And no one's raising their hand, so I'm going to go on. Well, hang on, Tony. I'll let you ask it. Let me just. Oh, yeah, okay. Qu question calcium chloride used for mining. Um, yeah, calcium.
I'm back. I just I just got kicked out and I'm back again. All right. Okay. So that reaction that we just saw was an example of a precipitation reaction. So if you go back to the components in the reaction. I Let me go back to the simplest form of the equation. I started with two substances that were dissolved in water. When I mixed them together, I instantly got a single solid coming out of the solution. So when we we mix two solutions and we end up with a solid falling out of the solution, we call that a precipitate. So this reaction here is we're going to refer to that as a precipitate reaction. So another word for this is, you might see it referred to as double displacement or double replacement because we have two ions that switch places with each other in the compound. So sometimes you may see the word precipitation reaction or double replacement or double displacement. So often many of these ions are going to involve um, ions in the reaction that switch places with each other. Okay. So when you're looking at something that is a precipitation reaction, you have two substances that are dissolved in water. We might want to analyze what the potential product would be. Very often with a precipitation reaction, we'll just take the positive ions and switch them with each other and the negative ions and switch them with each other and just and determine from those two separate ions with their alternate partners what the products will be. So once we get to that point, we want to look at if any of the products is not soluble in water, which in the previous case it was. Okay, the silver chloride was not soluble in water. But if we do mix two things together and we look at the reaction, we look at our potential products and neither of them are insoluble, then pretty much in that case, you, you wouldn't see a reaction occur because both your reactants and your products are insoluble in water. So really nothing has changed. You just, you just made a mixture of two salts. Okay. So often when we're looking at a double replacement reaction, what we're going to focus on to determine if a reaction takes place is if one of the products is not soluble in water. And that means it will form a precipitate. If it is soluble in water, it's going to stay in solution and you're not going to really observe anything occurring in that particular reaction. Okay, so there's a couple problems on the homework that I posted in the Chem 101. So it's going to ask you to try to predict the products of different reactions. And they'll, there's a little bit of guidance in, on how to solve these reactions. But once you determine whether a particular product is going to be produced, this chart is going to tell you whether or not a substance is soluble or insoluble in water. It was basically just a simple set of rules, and you're going to use these rules to determine if a particular product is going to be insoluble or not, and that will allow you to determine if the reaction occurs. So when you're looking at these potential reactions, if both your products are, insolu uh, are soluble, then you can pretty much conclude that the reaction didn't take place. Let me move on. Okay, so if I look at this reaction right now, now in this case, it's actually telling you if something is soluble or not with the lead iodide. But let's say we didn't know that. So let's say none of these 
the products were labeled whether or not they were going to be soluble or not. So if you're looking at this reaction, you have your reaction chain products, but it doesn't tell you if something's soluble or not. So right away, we wouldn't know just by looking at this if this reaction would go to completion. But we can look at the solubility rules here to determine if it's soluble or not. So take this lead iodide, PBI2. Now I see that soluble compounds contain group one metal cations, halide ions, chloride ions, which we have a chloride, but there's an exception is lead. So many combinations of lead with any of these ions on the side means, since lead is an exception, that's not going to be soluble in water. It's, so that's an indicator that that PBI2 is insoluble. Which I have, which I have on this. Nope, oh, sorry, went too fast again. There we go. Okay, so the PBI two is insoluble in water. Okay. So there's just a couple. There'll be a couple questions on the homework on that. Um. They there's some guidance examples on there for how to solve the equations related to this. So. Um, when you're going through the problems, if you do have questions, um, just either email me or post or post them to the message board, and we'll um, I'll see if I can give you a hand with those. Okay, going on. Okay, so here's another example. We have sodium chloride, silver nitrate. And we're producing silver chloride and sodium nitrate. So in this case, here's another example. The silver chloride is insoluble, so that indicates we have a reaction. Now, since the silver chloride is the only thing that forms as a precipitate from the reaction, our net ionic agent is just the formation of the silver chloride from the silver and chloride ions. Everything else, the sodium and the nitrate, are just spectra ions. They're ions floating in solution on the left. They're ions floating in the solution on the right. So they haven't changed in that reaction. Only thing that's really changed is the silver combining with the chloride to form a precipitate that falls out of the solution. OK. So another common reaction that we'll see is acid-base reactions. So if you look up what's an acid and what's a base, you're going to find a lot of different definitions. I don't, and even if you look at this book in the later section, you're going to find at least three different definitions for acids and bases. I don't want you to worry about that yet. So would at this point, we're just looking at the very simplest type of acid. And so an acid-base reaction is just going to be a simple case where you see a hydrogen ion is going to be transferred from one substance to another. We're going to call that's our simple example of a acid-base reaction. So here's an example. We have hydrochloric acid and we dissolve it in water. So the hydrogen ion falls off the chloride ion and attaches itself to the water. So the water becomes, goes from H2O to form an H3O ion, which we refer to as a hydronium ion. And the chloride just loses its hydrogen, so it becomes a floating chloride ion. So in this case, we have a transfer of hydrogen. So that's what makes this reaction an acid-base reaction. The substance that's giving off the hydrogen is going to 
can be considered an acid. And the substance that's absorbing the hydrogen is acting as a base. OK, questions on that? No questions. Can people hear me? Oh, good. No. It, was, it was very quiet, so I wasn't sure. Tony, what was your question? This is this also true? Um, hang on, let me make you live, and I can ask it because I know it's a little awkward typing a complicated question. Okay, Tony, you're alive. So, is this also true for solvents? Yeah, well, basic or a solvent. Yeah, a solvent is just sub something that you're dissolving something into. So, in this case, in this reaction, water is a solvent. Okay, because the hydrochloric acid is dissolved in water, and but and so is the hydronium ion. But some of the some of those water molecules actually participate in the reaction. Not all of them do, but it is a small fraction. Them. So in this case, water is not is a solvent, and it's a participate in the reaction. So there's actually some water, water molecules aren't doing anything; they're just floating around. But every now and then, that hydrogen ion comes off the chloride ion and attaches itself to the water. So water serving in this case, water serving its two roles: it's acting as a solvent, but it's also a participate in the reaction. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes. Now, as far as an organic solvent, is it the same for it? Whether it's organic or inorganic solvent, a solvent is just a substance that you dissolve a substance in, uh, you, you dissolve something into and make a solution. Um, organic solvents are usually are solvents that are now I'm getting into a little bit of advanced area, but they're considered nonpolar. So something like turpentine would be considered an inorganic solvent, or paint thinner, or um, even nail polish remover is uh, an example of an organic solvent. Even gasoline could be considered a solvent if you in certain cases, and and then usually substances that are oils or greases will dissolve in these organic solvents, but. Um, Substances that are either salts or um, polar molecules will mix better, will dissolve in water, because water is also polar. OK, um, let's go on. Okay, so here's here's just an illustration of the same reaction. Okay, we have hydrochloric acid, which is a gas, bubbling it through the water, and when it bubbles through the water, okay, it dissolves and it reacts. So it forms the H3 plus ion, which is the we refer to as hydronium ion, and the chloride are just left by itself. Okay, so again. An acid base reaction because the hydrogen is coming off the HCl and being given to the water, changing the water into a hydronium ion. Now, notice in this illustration, not all the water molecules change, only a very, very small fraction of the water present is going to go from H2O to H3O. Okay. But because HCl is considered a strong acid, this is actually the same acid that's in your stomach that helps you to digest food, every HCl molecule that's going to go in the water is going to dissolve. So acids that completely react in this way are going to be called strong acids. So in other words, if an acid 
such as HCL, where every single HCL donates that hydrogen ion and gives it to water like that, that's considered a strong acid. Now, there's some acids that are weak where they may not all of the acids would donate that hydrogen. So, these are now these are examples of very strong acids: hydrogen, HBr, hydrogen. All right, I am back. Okay, so what I was saying is all these cases we have strong acid. So virtually all of the HCl is getting donated to the solution and producing the product, which is the H3O. So the even more substances that are considered weak acids. Now, weak acids only partially react with water. So most of them, when they dissolve in water, do not change. But for a weak acid, only a small amount of the substances that are dissolved will produce hydronium ions and as they combine with water. OK. So, Here's an example of a weak acid, acetic acid. This is vinegar. So with vinegar, you notice in this equation, we have this double-sided arrow. So that, that, when you see a double-sided arrow, that re means a reaction can go both ways. It's, it, it's a back and forth reaction. So in this case, a only about 1% of the acetic acid molecules are present in that ionized form. And, but most of it is on the product side. I'm sorry, most of it is on the reactants. So again, that double arrow is just indicating a reaction that goes back and forth. Now, it doesn't tell you what percentage you'll find in the reactant and product form. This is, that's an advanced topic when you get into a uh, um, reaction uh, balancing and I mean um, neutralization um, reaction ratios but that that's an advanced topic but in this case when you just see a double arrow that just indicates a reaction can go both ways but in this case it's a weak acid so only a very small percent amount of it is being produced but it's still considered an acid base reaction because even though there's a small amount, we still have that hydrogen that's getting donated to the water. Okay. So another common weak acid, in addition to um, acetic acid, vinegar, is um, citric acid. That's the acid in orange juice and a lot of lemons, limes, a lot of fruits. So again, it's a weak acid, so you're not going to burn your mouth when you eat it. But you you can detect it. Your, your tongue is your taste buds are actually able to detect acids, and that's what gives it that that acidic or citrus taste when you eat it. Oh. Let me go back. Okay. So again, 
bases like acids have a lot of different definitions. I'm giving you the very simplest definition. This is all you need to be responsible for. So if you start Googling acids and bases, you're going to find a lot of diff other definitions of them. Um, we're just talking the very simplest definition. We sometimes refer to these RNAs definitions. So in this case, the base is going to be a substance when it dissolves in water is going to produce hydroxide ions. Okay, so examples of bases, obviously, they're going to be compounds that have hydroxide ions in them and are soluble in water. So when they dissolve, the OH ion, hydroxide ion, separates from the positive ion and they disassociate in water. And like acids, okay, bases are if they completely disassociate in water, are considered strong bases. If they only partially disassociate, we're going to consider them weak bases. Okay, so good example of a um, strong base is sodium hydroxide. This is also referred to as lye, L-Y-E. Um, so this is this is just like. Um, Acids can cause burns. Bases actually are also can cause burns because they can break down proteins and have similar effects, um, similar sensations. So, I mean, if you've ever seen, um, lye is commonly used to make soap. Um, we take um, sodium hydroxide and you'll take some type of fat and you'll um, heat up the uh, the fat in the presence of a strong base, and it'll actually produce some um, we call a fatty salt, and which is base, which is soap. If you ever, if you ever seen the movie Fight Club, where there's a scene where um Brad Pitt pours um lye on his hand, and he's it's burning, and he he wants to pour water on it, but that's make it worse. So th that scene in Fight Club, and he and there's actually a little bit of a there's a little bit of a good chemistry in there. Um, in order to get rid of the burning sensation, he actually has to pour an acid on the lye that will neutralize the base. And that because the um, pouring water on it is not going to help; it's just going to cause the the base reaction to occur, and it would actually get more painful. So lye, but and lye is act, and that was the reason they had lye because in that movie they were making soap, and um, lye is one of the main components that you use to make soap. If you end up, in fact, if you end up taking um, one of the chemistry of living systems course, one of the labs they, they've done in the past is they'll use um, different types of fats to and, and, the, and heat it with lye and you'll actually make, can make soap. Okay. So a weak base is a substance that only partially forms ions when dissolved in water and produces hydroxide ions. Now, ammonia is is considered a weak base. Now, look at an ammonia. You don't see any hydroxide ions. So right away you're thinking, why would the, why should this be a high, why is this a base? There's no hydroxide ions. But look at this reaction. Look what happens when it combines with water. It doesn't release hydroxide ions, but it comes up to a water molecule and plucks a hydrogen off the water molecule. So the H2O has an hydrogen removed from it, and the NH3 becomes NH4, and presto, we have a hydroxide ion. So this is considered an acid-base reaction. But in this case, water is acting as the acid. Water is the one that's donating the hydrogen ion, and ammonia is acting as the base. But in this case, the result is the same. We're still producing hydroxide ions when we dissolve it in water. So even though the hydroxide is not part of the original base, it has the same effect. Okay, when we put it in water, it 
it's still producing hydroxide ions, so it's considered a base. It's just a different process than what we saw from the other examples. So it's one, it's one of the weird exceptions for these bases is ammonia, even though you don't see the OH on it, it is a base because it does produce these hydroxide ions when you dissolve them in water. But it's a weak base. Okay. So some examples of ammonia. Now we know ammonia is used in cleaners. You've always Lysol, Pine Sol, that stuff that we're now you, we're telling you to kill these, uh, kill the viruses, is because it's a base. And bases have, do a great job of breaking down proteins. And one of the reasons we're they're using ammonia as a cleanser with the coronavirus is because viruses are very simple structures. They, they're technically not even alive. They're it's a protein envelope with a little bit of RNA inside it. And when it infects, it can the RNA gets injected in your cells, and then your cells get taken over by the RNA, and they start produ producing multiple copies of the uh, virus, and the cell bursts, producing all the copies of the virus that it was programmed to do. It's, it's almost similar to how a computer virus works. You know, a computer virus gets in your system and takes over the operations of your system, causing it to do something that you don't want it to do. Well, a biological virus gets into a cell, and the instructions in the virus take over the cell to get the cell to do things that it normally wouldn't be doing. So with ammonia, it break, ammonia does a job and it breaks down the protein so it basically kills the virus, or, or it may, I should say viruses technically are alive, so it makes the virus non-functional. And that, that's why we've been using ammonia on in a lot of these cleansers. Another, now, another use of ammonia is it's used in chemical fertilizers because it can actually introduce nitrogen into the soil and plants absolutely need nitrogen. In fact, all organisms need nitrogen, but for nitrogen is one of the primary components in amino acids, which we know if you've taken biology, I used in proteins, and nitrogen is one of the primary components in DNA and RNA. Um, you need nitrogen in those compounds. So, and the only way we can get nitrogen is from either chemical sources or from bacteria. Um, in fact, bacteria are the only form of life on Earth that is able to extract nitrogen from the air. Any other organism, even though it's not capable of pulling out of the air. Okay. So I've talked about acid-base reactions. Well, we have um, we have a strong acid and a weak base, and we end up producing either hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions in water. Now, a neutralization reaction is a very specific type of acid-base reaction, where we take an acid and a base and we combine them together. And what we produce is salt water. So here's an example of an acid-base reaction. Okay, we, t we have hydrochloric acid, which is your stomach acid, and magnesium hydroxide. So if you've had milk of magnesia, this is one of the components in that. So MgO2 plus your stomach acid. Okay. And what we get as a product is just water and magnesium chloride, which is just salt. Okay, salt is just a is a ionic compound that's soluble in water. So we've neutralized both the acid and bases, and all we result with is salt water. 
So a neutralization reaction is when we take two acids and bases and combine them, and we end up with a product that's neither really a strong acid or a strong base. And this, you're, when you have take Tums for heartburn, this is the reaction you're trying to get to happen. Okay, you might have an excess of acid in your stomach, and Tums is a weak base. Okay, it's the calcium core, the calcium carbonate in Tums acts as a base, and it helps to neutralize the acid, and you end up with a salt water. So, so enough about acids and bases, another type of reaction. Now, if you take an um, advanced chemistry class, you'll pr you might spend a good chapter or two on this type of reaction, but I want to just get into the basics of this type of reaction. This is what we call oxidation reduction reaction or sometimes called referred to as a redox reaction. Now the definition of a redox reaction is very simple. Okay. A redox reaction is just an any reaction where you see a transfer of electrons. Okay. So Whenever you have a transfer of electrons in a reaction, you can consider that oxidation reduction reaction. In this case, we have sodium atoms and chlorine, chlorine molecule. Both of them on as a product are electrically neutral. They're not ions. But when they combine, they form sodium chloride, which is table salt, which is an ionic compound. So the sodium went from an atom with no charge to a sodium ion with a plus positive one charge. And the chlorine, when it was combined with itself in Cl2, had no charge and it formed a negative ion. So here, whenever you see a charge change when going from a reactant to a product, that indicates a transfer of ions. Electrons are the only things that move around in reactions. So, if I I can break this to two half reactions. So, in the first part, I can see that the sodium becomes a sodium ion and releases two electrons. And on the and then the other part of the reaction is the chlorine gas grabs those two electrons to form the chloride ions. So you can see here where the transfer of electrons is taking place. The sodium gives up the electrons and the chlorine accepts the electrons. And whenever you have that happening, that's an oxidation reduction reaction. It's just a reaction involved the transfer of electrons. So sum up in this case, the sodium atoms lose electrons and the chloride ions gain electrons. So the, the two parts of this reaction are called the oxidation part and the reduction part. So when something is oxidized, that just means it's losing electrons. And if something is reduced, that means it gains electrons, which is a little bit confusing. You think, why, why do we call it reduction if it's gaining electrons? But if you think of the charges, okay, because electrons have negative charges, gaining electrons makes your charge more negative. So that's where the reduction comes from. Okay, gaining elect by going because you're gaining electrons, your charge gets more negative. So that's that's why we call it reduction. And there's another mnemonic we can use for this. So if you write out Leo, the lion goes Gur. So Leo, L E O, the lion goes Gur, G E R. So if you look at the first part, L E O stands for loss of electrons is oxidation. And Gur, G E R, Gain of electrons is reduction. 
So when I learned chemistry, that was the old mnemonic I used to kind of remember the difference between oxidation and reduction. Okay. So now to more to make it even more complicated, we also can have we also have at the same time ox reducing and oxidizing agents. So a re oxidizing agent is something that causes something else to be reduced, and a reducing agent is something that causes something else to be oxidized. So since sodium is ca causing chlorine to be reduced, we call sodium the reducing agent. And since chlorine is causing something else to be oxidized, it's the oxidizing agent. So let me go back to this previous slide to look at the reaction. OK. So since sodium lost electrons, it was oxid it's being oxidized. And since chlorine is gaining electrons, it's being reduced. So, so sodium is oxidized, chlorine is reduced. But since sodium is causing something else to be reduced, we call sodium is a reducing agent. And because chlorine is causing something else to be oxidized, we call it an oxidizing agent. So you'll see the term coming up. If whatever is oxidized is um, being um, reduced, and whatever is being um, oxidized is the a reducing agent, and that's a good point. Um, chlorine and NCL is oxidizing. Um, not actually, not in that case. When um, usually with um, with salt water, they say, yeah, I don't, I don't know. You're saying that um, rust is an oxidizing reaction, and it is um, usually salt water does promote oxidation but in that case it's actually acting as a catalyst it's the it's actually um it's actually the i believe it's the oxygen present in the water that's really causing the rust to occur but um by in the presence of salt it's acting as a catalyst and causes the oxidation to occur much faster than it would if it was on its own because in that case when you have salt water it's actually our it's already been oxidized and reduced, but it's actually it's acting as a catalyst in that case, Tony. Okay, so so here's another example. So I have H two chlorine hydrogen gas and chlorine gas, and I'm producing HCl. Now, normally you'd think, okay, this, the products and the reactants are both covalent compounds. So right away you think, okay, is this an oxidation reduction reaction? Um, because I'm not, I'm not producing ions as a product. But this is still considered an oxidation reduction reaction because you know, we haven't really gotten to this point of different types of covalent bonds, but in this case, because I the chlorine, there are electrons being shared between the hydrogen atoms and the chloride ions. In that case, the electrons are being shared evenly. In hydrogen chloride, even though it's covalent, the electrons are not being shared evenly. So there's a partial transfer of electrons, because going from electrons that are being shared evenly to electrons that are being shared unevenly. So if that occurs, it's still considered a reduction reaction, okay? Because there's a change 
in how evenly the electrons are being shared. So in this case, for a bookkeeping case, we look at the oxidation number or oxidation state of an element. Now, oxidation All right, that wasn't too bad. I got kicked off for a few seconds. All right, so the book is, is given a couple rules on how to identify an oxidation number, but in this case, this case is a little simple. Even though this HCl is not covalent, if it was ionic, we know that the chlorine would have a negative one charge, so if the chlorine was an ion, then the hydrogen would have to have a plus one charge. So in that case, we're, we're imagining the charges would be if it was ionic compound, and that's where the oxidation number comes from. We know if, with hydrogen chlorine, there it's a single element, it's sharing with itself. We know the electrons are being shared evenly because they, they're the same element. They don't, not one is pulling harder than the other on their electrons. So there, in that case, the electron, the ionic state would be zero. Okay, let me move on. So these are just some rules for assigning oxidation numbers. I'm not going to get into too much detail for tests on this. Um, so I'm mostly, if I, if we look at oxidation reduction reactions on exams, I'm going to mainly focus on some simple examples, like if you have. Um, something with, uh, but just by looking at the ionic charges. But a little more advanced level of this for oxidation numbers. So if you have to tackle problems that may not involve ionic compounds and you still have to determine if their oxidation reduction reaction is going on, you can follow these rules to kind of assign an oxidation number. So first rule is pretty straightforward. Oxidation number of an atom in an elemental substance is zero. That just means if I have an element bonded to itself or a single atom by itself, the oxidation number is considered zero. Um, if the element can be is in a monatomic ion, I'm gonna the oxidation number is gonna be the same as its charge. In some of these cases, you can use these other oxidation numbers when you have other elements combined with ions. So hydrogen has two cases. If if hydrogen is combined with a non-metal, it's going to act as a positive ion, so it's going to have a oxidation number plus one. If it's combined with a metal, it's the metal is going to be positive, and hydrogen will have a negative charge. Oxygen is all these complicated rules, but in most of the cases you're going to think of oxygen as having a minus two charge. And then halogens, which is just like the rule with um,
All right, I'm back. So with oxidation numbers, in some ways, they're very much like ionic charges. In a compound, the sum of the oxidation numbers in a single compound have to add up to zero, or if it's a polyatomic ion, it has to equal the charge of the ion. So we're still, the all the charges still have to balance and equal the sum of the, the, the charge of the entire formula. Okay, um, just to simplify time, I'm gonna skip it a little bit. Okay. So here's a specific type of redox reaction. Now, if you notice from my earlier definition, Oxidation reduction reaction do not necessarily have to involve oxygen. Okay, it's just kind of a, mis a strange coincidence that we call it redox, even though it really doesn't necessarily have to involve oxygen by the definition. It just has to involve a transfer of electrons. But there is a very special type of oxidation reduction reactions that actually do involve oxygen. Though not necessarily O2, but just oxygen atoms. And so in that case, with we have a transfer of electrons in an oxidation reduction reaction, but the actual reduction is occurring from an oxygen atom or an oxygen molecule. So here's an example of rocket fuel, okay? So rocket fuel, you have to be able to burn stuff in outer space where there's no oxygen in the air. So we have this special reaction, okay? We have aluminum and ammonium chlorate. Now, ammonium chlorate is actually producing the oxygen that we use in the reaction. So with this reaction, the chlorate is providing the oxygen. And notice, if you look on the other side, the aluminum is getting oxidized, okay? Aluminum is going from aluminum metal to aluminum oxide, which is a form of aluminum rust. And then some of the aluminum atoms are combining with the chlorine. So in this case, in both cases, the aluminum is getting oxidized. And the oxygen and the chlorine in both cases being reduced. Okay. And with this reaction, okay, we're producing a lot of heat, light, and um, flame. And this reaction is sometimes we're also referred to as a thermite reaction because it produces a huge amount of heat and it can actually, um, you actually get some liquid metal in the reaction. Okay. So that's one type of redox reaction, combustion, which is a re oxidation reduction reaction in which either an oxygen atom or O2 is the component that's being reduced. Here is another type of redox reaction. Now, it's still re oxidation reduction because we can see there's a transfer of electrons taking place. But this is called a single replacement reaction because we have a single element on one side of the reaction and it switches places with another element producing a new single element on the other side. So in this case, we have copper metal and we combine it with a silver nitrate. Silver nitrate is usually a solution that you use in um, photography for film developing. But if I take the copper, I put it, put it with the silver nitrate. The silver nitrate solution, which is tend to be a little bit of a grayish solution, starts to turn blue, like um, the color of Windex. 
that blue color you see is the copper ions that are being oxidized. So the oxidized carbon, cop, I'm sorry, oxidized copper gives it that bluish color in the solution. And you see these silver flakes um, start to form out of the solution. So you actually, you take copper and put it in a solution of silver nitrate and the copper gets replaced with silver. Now before you think, now before you start thinking I can make a, turn copper into silver from this reaction, the silver nitrate is actually a lot more expensive than the uh, silver you get from it. So you're not, it's not a, it's not a money maker to try to turn copper into silver. But it does look like that when you observe a reaction. So in this case, the copper left side is, is neutral, doesn't have a charge, but when it combines with nitrate, it forms a copper two ion. So it has a plus two charge. So right, I'm sorry, yeah, plus two charge. So the copper goes from zero to plus two. So it's being oxidized and the silver goes from a plus one charge when it's combined with the nitrate to zero. So that the silver is being reduced. So again, this is an example of it. We call it a single replacement reaction because the copper and the silver switch places. We end up with a single element and a compound producing a new single element in the compound as a product. Okay. So just here, here's the example of reaction. It's kind of cool if you to watch it. Okay, so we have the silver nitrate solution. Um, we put the copper metal inside the solution. Right away, you you see the copper starts to turn this silvery color as the silver immediately starts to precipitate and form on the copper. Now, eventually, after a while, you see these large clumps of silver, which you see in the picture C, which are just falling off as the copper gets eaten away. And the solution goes from clear to blue. And the blue solution, that Windex color you see, is the color of the oxidized copper ions. So now the copper is in the solution and the silver has come out of the solution. So that's, that's an example of a single replacement reaction. It's always an element and usually a compound often dissolved in water and two, one ion switches places with another ion. Okay. Um, this is kind of more of an advanced topic, so I'm not going to really get into too much detail of this. Um, this is just examples of balancing redox reaction. Obviously, if you want to look at it in the book, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to put this on the test. I might, if, if you want, I might, I might put a few um, example problems if you just want to pra practice them. But I'm not going to. I'm not going to put on the test. So I don't want to get into too much detail of this tonight. Okay, so that was pretty much it for the lecture tonight. Um, any questions so far? Okay, thank you. Okay, Gabriel, hang on. Let me. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna make you let you talk. Okay, Gabriel, you're live. Do you, uh, question? You can talk. Or if you don't have a microphone, you can just uh, type your question. I'm not hearing you, so I'm gonna. Yes, I did. I did. 
the lecture. So you'd be able to go back to it. I mean, around the spot where I went up again. Um, hopefully next week the connection's better. Um, but I, w I will record it. And um, if it just continues to be the skip lecture, I might just switch to a, a different um, for the lecture and just to a shortened session, live session, answer questions. But we'll see how next week goes. And we'll get the interaction with the uh, lecture. But if it doesn't go, the I will um, yeah, I'll just end up recording the lecture and posting as a PowerPoint lecture. Um, Georgina, for the handout, I did post these slides on board so that you have access to. For the homework for this week, it's going to be just the set of problems that are on the Chem 101 interface. So if you're able, so hope it looks like everyone is able to get into it. Um, and I noticed a few of you actually did go ahead and solve the optional homework assignment in setting the the PDF again homework that was written out. Um, again, both you can if you did the uh, op the Chem 101 homework instead of the homework I handed out before lecture. It's okay because it's the same problems, types of problems. So you'll you'll get your practice doing either assignment. But going forward, I'm gonna make just start posting the assignments in the Chem 101 interface, and we'll be able to do it that way. Just it gives an easier interface. It allows you to try out a little more with the dimensional analysis problems and gives you a better framework to work with. And link to the section of the book. So you can actually click on the link and actually read the section of the text that that type of problem is specifically referring to. So let me see if I can get into this. And if I can't share Chem 101 tonight, I will make sure I post the um, questions um, either tonight or next or um, next few days. I will um, end up uploading the solutions to the PDF assignment if you did do those. If you and make if you if you did do those assignments, just make sure you scan it and email it to me. On the Chem 101, if you just submitted it, I have your answers, so I, you don't need to do anything else with on the Chem 101. The one you submit it. I'll be able to see how you did, and um, I'll just I'll give you credit for that those assignments. Um, so was everyone did anyone not have
Okay. So, not seeing. I got booted out again. Not seeing any questions. Was it, so I'm. Um, I guess I'll end lecture tonight. If there were, I will post some. I can definitely post some practice exams on the interface, so you'll be able to see those. And um, so, absolutely, I'll definitely, I'll, I'll pick questions that are very similar to the exam, so we can have that. Um, for the exams, I'll be using the same interface, so the exams will be very similar to the type of questions you're having on the homework. Um, only differences with the exams will be a specific number of attempts per question, and um, I'll, I'll again break it up into two parts. One part will be timed, so you'll be able to just uh, complete it once, and and there'll be another set of questions that'll be untimed, but you'll have a certain number of attempts to solve the problems. Now, when I say timed, I don't mean like I'm gonna be generous with the time. I'll pretty much give you the full lecture period that you would have to solve it. So, but um, you won't be able to like start it one day, save it, continue it uh, the next day and that. So with the that type of test question, you have to start it and finish it in a single session. But I'll, um, as we go through, I'll start to give you a more details on that. Um, so again, ha ha thank you for sh coming tonight. Um, Again, I'm recording this, so I will post this on, it should be available as soon as I stop recording on uh, virtual class. And um, I'll see if I can uh, upload it to Blackboard, so in, ca in case you have trouble viewing the lecture through this tool. Okay, so um, week. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm be working from home, so I'll have, um, you should be able to just jump on to either the online sessions if you need extra help. So uh, thank you all. Have a good night.